We're here. Yahoo. <laughs> We're recording something. Yay. Yay. Uh, well, we can wait a little bit till some people arrive because I think this was not the link that we shared. Um, so we can wait or we can just get started. I mean, what do you think, Jackie? I think we just... I think that we just start trucking along. Just go for it. Okay. We just go for that it. That's great. Okay. Let's go for it. Okay. So first, I'll um, I'll introduce okay. you and I'll introduce me. How's that sound? That's that sounds good. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So hi everybody. I am Natalie Palomino. I'm the founder of North Authentic. We're a conscious hair care retailer, and what that means is is that we only carry products that are free of toxic chemicals that are listed on our barred ingredient list. Um, so, you know, keeping toxic, toxic chemicals out of our lives from our hair care to our beauty products to even our household products are extremely important to me and to our company. Um, and today we are talking to the extremely knowledgeable and amazing Jackie Bowen. Jackie is the executive director for the Clean Label Project. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about her. Um, so before going into the Clean Label Project, she held numerous technical standards development and leadership roles with the World Health Organization Collaborating Center, NSF International. Um, and most recently, she served as the general manager of Quality Assurance International, the largest domestic USDA organic certifier, um, the director of... Um, NSF International's Consumer Values Verified Division, focusing on bringing to market certification um, offerings, including non-GMO project and certified gluten-free, and the director of NSF Agriculture North America, focusing on focusing on farm food safety. Um, Jackie earned a BS in Environmental Biology from Michigan State University, um, a Master of Public Health and Management Policy from the University of Michigan, a Master of Science in Quality Engineering from Eastern Michigan University, and Postgraduate Certificate in Innovation and Business Strategy from MIT. Holy mackerel, that was like a lot of oxygen with your bio, wow. Jackie. <laughs> I just, you know what, Natalie, I just tell people I am just a professional buzzkill at dinner parties. So if you want to be talked out of eating or drinking or using anything, I'm your girl. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Yes, that's, that's so just, that's, do you, that's my uh, do you, what do you, like, I'm going to side note here, but like, what do you, how do you grocery shop? Like, how do you find, because I know you focus on food labels and household products, yes. but when you're like at a dinner party, like, what are you telling people to eat? Just like celery, organic celery? <laughs> you know, it's, it's really funny. And obviously, I mean, the thing is, especially, you know, Natalie, with all of your followers, you guys do such an amazing job when it comes to setting standards of hair care. But, you know, let's be honest, there is so much room for improvement, even within the food category. And we've been hearing about it right now when it comes to baby food for everybody's kiddos at home, you know, when you're talking about heavy metals. And so the thing is, it's like, for me, is this whole issue of heavy metals and pesticides. We've got problems in our, in our food supply as well as in our consumer products. So for me, it's one where, you know, I'm personally, I'm a, I'm a vegetarian. Um, it's one where, yes, I try to stick to, you know, organic as much as possible, but, you know, everybody has their vice. And so um, in a lot of cases, in some cities, let's be honest, the beer is cleaner than oh the gosh. water when it comes to heavy metal which is crazy yeah right, yeah, right? Um, but then there's also like you know there's there's certain things I mean sometimes in you know kind of the line of work of toxicology and statistics sometimes conventional um, wisdom you know facts fly in the face of conventional wisdom of what people perceive is clean and safe um, actually when you look at the data it looks totally different um, so it's one where at least for me and food a couple a couple tips and like examples that I love to use is that so many people, when you go and you eat like Chinese restaurant and stuff, you'd be like, oh, I've got to get the brown rice. I've got to feel a lot better about eating this, you know, the your Chinese food takeout and things like that. But, you know, to be honest, when it comes to arsenic, um, arsenic happens to sit in the hull of the rice. That's the brown part of the rice. And so, you know, for the most part, rice is kind of nutritionally void. And so it's one where if you get enough fiber in your diet, going for the white rice is not a bad option just because the brown rice has, you know, in general has more of this concentrated arsenic than the white rice does. So, you know, but for those that need more fiber in your diet, brown rice is great. It's just really important to make sure you diversify in order to kind of minimize that exposure. Wow. No, 
Oh, wait, I did not know that about arsenic. You know what's so funny? I love that you just said that it's void of nutrition because I actually cut rice out of my diet like years ago because I'm like, there's no nutritional value here. It's just calories. And that wasn't even for reasons other than just like, it's a carb. But yeah. to know that brown rice has arsenic in it, that's crazy. Yeah, and, and the thing is when it comes to heavy metals too, Natalie, is it's, it's important to note that, you know, heavy metals are naturally present in the earth's crust. Back in high school and in middle school, when you were learning about that periodic table of elements, all those same heavy metals were on there and they're naturally present in the earth's crust. But, you know, at the end of the day, we have to be realistic about that because of the societal choices that we've made around mining, fracking, industrial agriculture, these things that dump in the air, the water, and the soil, and then less brands like yours proactively decide to give a damn and think about safety differently, then it's a matter of these things end up in our food as well as our consumer products. And, you know, where at all possible, it's a matter of minimizing that exposure for, you know, health in the short term as well as the long term. Wow. Um, very good people who haven't really um, gotten into heavy metals. Like I took a test a couple of years ago and found out I had a lot of heavy metals in my blood, a lot of mm. aluminum, which made me change over my deodorant. Um, but also I, I do hair. So I was like, um, I'm touching water like 500 times a day. Yeah. So I, and then I want to talk to you about and, and educating people about our skin too, about how that is like a huge driver of getting these chemicals into our bodies. But, um, yeah, I noticed that. And so what, what are the bad heavy metals and what exactly does it do to our body and are heavy metals in a lot of household products or is it more <laughs> like gluten? Yeah, it's. It's interesting. So yes, I mean, the heavy metals that, you know, typically you see a lot of the focus on would be your total arsenic, cadmium, lead, mercury. All of them have um, different types of links to things like long-term chronic disease, long-term chronic disease, things like cancer, as well as infertility. Um, you know, in your state of California, you've got the very protective state of California Proposition 65, you know, which aims to inform consumers and give them informed choice of like, listen, this product contains levels that exceed, you know, our safety tolerance levels. You know, it has you know, potentially can cause exposure that results in reproductive harm and cancer, that type of thing. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's one where, you know, I always like to be clear that it's like, no way do I think that brands are out there proactively peppering their product with these, you know, with these heavy metals. And the thing is, it's like, it's in hair care products, there are some ingredients that actively contain heavy metals like lead, different types of lipsticks and things like that, just because it helps stuff stick. Um, but along those same lines, it's a matter of, you know, it's a matter of regulatory policy just really hasn't caught up with the science. You know, it's almost like, I mean, we see it all the time play out on the news. It's almost a glacial speed in which we're able to propagate regulations. And so we see all of this information coming out about safety. And it's especially, I mean, for all of your, you know, followers and, and consumers, Natalie, it's a matter of, um, you know, right now, I believe that you know, moms especially, I mean, they serve as the chief operating officers of their households. They are the arbiters of truth and safety. You know, it's one where, you know, frankly, from my perspective, use consumer education can absolutely pull through industry and regulatory reform. Um, consumers can be the ones that, you know, stand up for what they believe is good enough, as well as really progressive retailers like yourself. And at the end of the day, it's kind of like irrelevant um, what the regulations say. Consumer power will trump that. Yeah. I I would definitely want to get into um, like what household products and and as far as um, hair care products are we finding most of these toxic chemicals in. But first, I love what you just said about like how it's on the consumer to really kind of push for regulations. Um, as we haven't mentioned yet, but the beauty industry specifically isn't re regulated by any government authority, the FDA, nobody, nobody's doing any oversight. So before a product even goes to market, nobody's asking about the ingredients. They're not asking for tests of the ingredients and they're not even, you know, if, if there's any health hazards or, or negative causes to these ingredients, there's nobody there to kind of say, well, wait a second, you can't let this go out on market. You can't start selling this on the shelves. Um, so what can the consumer do? do um, as if they were against toxic chemicals, like what can they do in order to try to push for regulations? Like what power does just the odd person have? Yeah, first and foremost, I'd say absolutely, you know, the power of being consumer and especially, especially social, social, social media. I mean, you get to call brands out. Yeah. 
publicly and ask questions and demand answers. So I would say just by being vocal, talking to your retailers, asking what kind of standards have you actually established? I mean, it's one where, you know, Natalie, I've, I've known you for a few years now and it's a matter of just like you, I mean, you love your no-no lists. You love making sure to just get into that nitty gritty and make sure that those, you know, chemicals that aren't, you know, the thing is, it's like you want, especially when you're talking about like your, um, you know, your hair care products and your cosmetics, you want them to work first and foremost, because if they don't, you're not going to buy them again. So you want to make sure they work. But in the process of doing so, you don't want to introduce like these high levels of these different types of chemicals either. So it's a matter of brands doing their diligence, just like you, Natalie, and like just asking more questions like it, why is it in there? Like what function does it actually serve? Um, and I think consumers grilling their brands about that too. I mean, when it comes to hair care products, so many people will purchase it and then it's one where they just stick to it and they just buy it over and over again. So it's a matter of doing your diligence, especially if it's one of your personal favorites. Yeah, no, 100%. And I, I tell people too, the number one thing they can do is just not buy the stuff. Because if there's less demand, then, then these companies that are producing these, you know, chemical heavy products are going to be like, there's, we're going to have to catch up because consumers are starting to understand what these ingredients actually mean. And if nobody's buying it, then they're going to have to make changes. Um, so that's like, to me, one of the, the big ones people can do too. Um, but yeah, so what household products would someone be surprised to know are really bad for them? Like, what would you say are maybe the top three household products, whether it's hair, beauty or cleaning or whatever, are you like, Almost every product out there and this type of cleaner is, is, is almost horrible. So, you know, what do they look for? So what is your top three? I'm going to go, I'm going to go with my, and it's crazy and it's a totally different direction that you're expecting me to go. And out of testing probably tens of thousands of food and consumer products, by far the category that is most contaminated first, pet food. <gasps> What? <laughs> Two thumbs down, right? No I mean, yes, yes. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, okay. So the thing is, it's like, from my perspective, the way I look at it is I've got two little rescue pooches over here. And, you know, they're nine, over 95% of pet owners consider their pooches part of the family. I know that I do. And 100%. so, it's when, yeah, and it's one when you think about your pets. I mean, you feed them the same thing every day, two to three times a day. And the thing is, it's like you think about the food and how much it costs and you think about how it's shelf stable, especially if you're buying kibble and you're not buying raw food. And the thing is, it's like when you're talking about heavy metals, we hear it all at the time, especially women that are pregnant. Don't eat too much sushi. Don't eat too much tuna. And the reason is like we hear about how heavy metals can bioaccumulate, especially in higher order fish. And the thing is where are those heavy metals, especially mercury in ocean fish, um, where it has a tendency to bioaccumulate is in different tissues the fat, the bones, um, and so what in the, the skin. And so then what happens is that, you know, when we're talking about what's used in pet food, sometimes on the packaging, you'll see these beautiful fillets of salmon, but let's be honest, what, what ends up in pet food is not the beautiful fillets. The stuff that ends up is called the rack. It's the bones, it's the fat, it's the skin, all of those places where the heavy metals have a tendency to bioaccumulate. So what you see is this concentrated amount of heavy metals within the food that's given to our pooches. So, um, but, but on a positive note, I will say this, that in the world of pet food, by far the cleanest protein source, turkey. So if you find a pet food and your pooch is good with it, go with turkey based. And it's also good for kitties, right? Some cats are, are good with turkey. The most contaminated are gonna be your fish based ingredients, just like we hear about limiting, you know, our own human intake to some of those higher order fish. Same thing holds true in pet food. Um, and then I would say my second favorite category that I love to hate would be the CBD category. So that's all the rage these days. You know, people are reaching for CBD to help offset, you know, impacts of, you know, anxiety or not being able to sleep and things like that. We did a study looking at the true contents of, I think it was 251 of America's top selling CBD products. Three major takeaways. Mm -hmm. Yes, big problems with heavy metals. The reason for it, hemp is a natural bioaccumulator. In fact, military installations plant hemp in order to clean up the stuff that's in the, that's in the dirt from, from military installations. The kicker is that so this plant is inherently really good at sucking up bad stuff from the dirt. Um, but along those same lines, it makes it not good when then you're going to turn around and consume it. 
Um, the other thing that's really interesting that we found in the CBD category was um, the, the potency being off. So what I mean by that is, for example, if you buy a CBD product, let's say a tincture, it says on the package it contains 100 milligrams. 70% of the time, we found that the product contained 120 milligrams or more or 80 milligrams or less. So I always kind of draw parallels of like, imagine if you were reaching for an ibuprofen. It's like, eh, it might be 200 milligrams. It might be 1,400. It's kind of like Christmas morning, Natalie. And so I, I'm a big fan of predictability. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, so that, that's it's crazy um but the thing is don't get me wrong with, with within both the p uh within both the pet food as well as the cbd category you've got a, a lot of really amazing brands that are trying to do right by consumers but both by their pocketbooks as well as by their health so it's a matter again just doing your diligence i mean marketing departments do an effective job at selling comfort and security natalie i mean go to the grocery store find me one product that says Eh, this product doesn't taste very good, but listen, we made our margins. We just used the BPA lined packaging. A little endocrine disruption never hurt anybody, which, you know, that's the problem is everything says it's full of wholesome goodness. How do you actually differentiate? And it's like consumers grill your brands, grill your retailers, ask more questions, demand answers. Yes, that is, I just, I just got introduced this year to the term greenwashing. So I'm going to have you explain, because I'm sure you are used to hearing this for years and years, because this is something that, you know, I only in the last pretty much three years have been on the toxic-free, life-changing yes. move. And so I'm, I'm learning, I've learned so much, but I know you, you know, yes. you're a guru. So for people who haven't heard of this, I'd love for you to explain what greenwashing is. Yeah, so basically what greenwashing is, is it's, it's that exact concept that we talked about, is that brands are out there trying to sell their product it's not one where they're like eh, listen this frankly i'll be honest this product doesn't work very good and eh, it's a little bit overpriced everything says that it's awesome so if that's the case how do you actually know and that's where data of like at least for me it's one where that's where data and science comes into it because let's be let's be honest like tandem lc mass spectrometers don't lie man <laughs> you know natalie that's why i love me some analytical chemistry um in order to frankly cut through the bs right and so, you know, from, from my perspective, um, you know, and that's what it is, is greenwashing is just like really effective marketing that pulls on those heartstrings that makes you buy a product for a reason other than the taste and price. It's like, you know what? I think that this, it's got this green leaf on it and that's got to mean it's good for the environment where it's like, nah, that's greenwashing. Yeah. Green leaves. Greenwashing, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, um, so why, why isn't there transparency in labels? Like why, um, why are these companies able to like not put everything that's in there? Oh, actually, let me take a side note. So one of the things that you told me about, which is why North Authentic adopted our, um, our additional oversight because there's nobody that actually, um, checks out the ingredient labels of these different hair care and beauty products. If we're going to take a step into hair care and beauty, um, they, there's nobody checking that's what is on the label is actually in the bottle. And so that was something that was new to me. So yeah. explain to me. So not only is it kind of scary as you're, you're explaining that we need to be our own advocates and read our labels, but something you told me is that sometimes we can't trust the label. No. So if you can elaborate on that, cause that was scary to me when I first learned about that. And that's why we created our oversight, um, yeah, which I love. I'm such a huge fan of. I mean, the thing is, it's like we take, especially at retail when buying stuff, we take everything at face value and we trust it because we think that somebody else is paying attention to it. But the thing is, you look at ingredient decks, you look at those nutrition decks and it's like, who's, who's double checking to make sure that's right? And the thing is, at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of nothing more than a pinky swear of like, no, no. The product says it's full of wholesome goodness. So that means it has to be full of wholesome goodness or whatever wholesome goodness is, or even the ingredient decks, same type of thing. Um, and so it's a matter of like, well, how are you going to be sure? You know, even when it's a matter of these brands that make stuff, it's one where it's like, you know, not all brands make their own products. Some of them actually go to manufacturers that make it for them. It's called co-manufacturing or, or uh, co-marketing. 
And in this case, it's a matter of like, you know, if this is what the ingredient deck says, maybe they had to make a few tweaks to the formulation. Maybe it's one where especially we see it all the time in retailers making these different types of no-no lists, no phthalates, no parabens. And the question I always like to let, ask is like, what exactly does no mean? Because in science, the way you look at it is like, well, do you mean no as in like absolute zero of like zip zero zilch? Do you mean no as in non-detect down to a sensitive sensitivity as at 20 parts per billion? Do you mean no as in, I didn't intentionally add it, but if it conveniently fell off the shelf into the product, listen, I'm not gonna claim that. What exactly does no mean? And so that's kind of like my thing is like, you see a lot of these different label claims and you see a lot of these retailers making these promises and these really bold standards, but then like, what are you doing other than just kind of entering into nothing more than a pinky swear? And that's where I love your program because it's a matter of like, nah, we don't trust the pinky swear either. You know, that's where good old fashioned science and analytical chemistry comes to play. It's like, it's a matter of keeping brands on their toes by like, we're just going to do random testing. We're not going to tell you when, we're not going to tell you where, we're just going to randomly pull it and send it for testing just to make sure that uh, we're on the up and up, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And even when, when we implemented this program, I think you had even mentioned to me too, because, you know, just transparency, Jackie has been really a, a, an amazing advisor to me at North Authentic on developing our board ingredient list um, and coming up with some of our safety standards. But um, yeah, like even if we want to give our brands the benefit of the doubt that they are being transparent on their ingredient labels, especially because we've worked so hard to find these really clean lines. But I think even you had mentioned once that, you know, a brand could actually change maybe the lab that they're using to make their ingredients or make their product. And maybe there's something else being made in that lab. And so there's some yes. cross contamination that even the owner of the brand may not Absolutely. know about. So when we do our random testing, we can actually notify the brand and say, look, we found this, even if it's 20 parts per billion, we found this in the, in the bottle you know, is this a mistake? And that's something that they can then look into and correct. Um, or maybe they admit that they've actually just left that off the label, in which case we would, you know, eliminate it from North Authentic. But that's um, another important thing is like sometimes, you know, sometimes maybe the brand doesn't know what's in there. Like you said, maybe it fell off the shelf. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I think there's, there could be a, multiple ingredients that are not on the label. And that's why, you know, we definitely want to do our due diligence and make sure that we're only using clean products that are, you know, full transparency by the company. And yeah. it is sad that I see, really yeah, I see no parabens, no sulfates, and vegan across the board of these lines when I was looking for products. And I'm like, oh, plant-based, vegan, no parabens, no sulfates. And then you start digging deeper into ingredients and you're like, there's thousands of toxic chemicals that are not sulfates and are not parabens. And of course, vegan has nothing to do with toxic chemicals or not. Um, so there, there could be a hugely plant-based product, but it's mixed with all these other yucky chemicals. And so I think that's another thing that people see those um, grand statements and they're like, oh, as long as it's sulfate-free, you know, everybody got used to sulfate-free. And I yes. feel like, you know, people are like, it's a sulfate-free shampoo and oh, I got it at the grocery store. And I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> you know, yeah. a really cheap product, what else is in there? Um, but yeah, I think people got so used to like knowing that sulfates are bad, but there's so many other things. And so one of the other questions I wanted to ask you is um, the cosmetic industry um, includes the beauty industry with like skincare, makeup, and hair. And so because it's considered cosmetic, it's not regulated by the government, of course, again. Um, so um, what are some commonly found toxins? I know we did some research on this that are in beauty products that you're finding in hair care products. So I, I completely agree with you that there's some of those, some of those kind of big three or big four, your parabens, your phthalates, your, um, I'm trying to think of some of the, uh, some of the other ones, maybe some toluene. You see certain types of ones that are really your sulfates, your really common ones that you're seeing those claims on all kind of packaging. You know, it's down to even, you know, very much your, your value price products. It's, it's almost one where it's like, it's great to see that the industry is moving forward and being much more aware of kind of these chemicals looking to remove them. But it's almost now time where it's like, 
yeah, yeah. I think everyone got the picture. Consumers don't want parabens, phthalates, um, you know, those kinds of things. You know, what's next? Um, yeah. And so yeah. what I love about kind of your um, standard and some of the ones that I see out there as kind of like the next frontier as some, um, you know, what's reasonable to ex expect when it comes to some progressive standards. Um, some of the chemicals that I love to hate within hair care, um, the first one would be formaldehyde. And so formaldehyde, you know, it's just like what you hear about. It's those different types of, you know, preservatives. And so formaldehyde, it's not necessarily going to say it on the package. Just like, <laughs> it's not going to say that. It's kind of like hidden within there. The other one that one thing are kind of that you will see on the label that I also love to hate is it's like you're seeing stuff related to look for things like paraffin and mineral oil. Those ones are fun only through the lens that they're using like your traditional petroleum based ingredients. So this is the whole thing where, especially if you're looking at it from a public and as well as an environmental health, this is all the same coming from the same source of petroleum that you think of when you're just thinking of like commercial oil type stuff. The other one that's really interesting that I also, that has been, you know, kind of from the environmental as well as the public health front um, are things like microbeads. Microbeads, if you're familiar with them, the, the little things that sometimes are really fun in shower gels um, that they like, apparently bust open and give you extra moisturizing goodness. Um, at least that's what it says on the package. So clearly <laughs> that means it's true. Nevertheless, these lovely, this lovely moisturizing goodness um, actually ends up going down, you know, the shower drain and getting embedded in fish gills and really con contaminating the aquatic streams and stuff. And so it's a matter of kind of brands recognizing kind of the long-term impacts. Um, but I mean, you've done, I mean, how, what is your list now? I mean, I know you're, you've are you been looking at things around synthetic fragrances yes. because even those things that, you know, when it comes to residual solvents and so what solvents are is like these really harsh chemicals in order to suck out um, different kinds of ingredients. So, I mean, your, what is your list up to these days? Um, we have hundreds and hundreds of most of it's because like a lot of these ingredients have like 20 or 30 names, right? So it's like, um, you know, silicone, like if people want to know where it's silicone, it's like dimethicone, and methicone. there's like a million different yes. things. And so we came up with like a list of hundreds of different ingredients that actually could be many of the same things. Yes. Like you said, formaldehyde is the same formaldehyde. Right. Um, but some other big guys like EDTA is a huge oh, product. Um, yeah. Phenoxidol, um, acrylates are, are no bueno, and they're in a ton yeah. of stuff. Um, some other, um, benzophene, I'm so bad with pronouncing, because you're the yeah. scientist, but there's like, what, octanoxate, what is that one, octanoxate? I mean, for you guys in California, octanoxate and oxybenzone, that's a fun one. So basically what those are, is you're looking at sunscreens. Um, basically you have two different types of sunscreens. You have chemical sunscreens and mineral sunscreens. The way that they work, mineral sunscreens sit on the surface of your skin and, um, and they basically block the sun's rays. Chemical sunscreens get absorbed into your skin and that's how they reflect the sun's rays. It's interesting because one of the things that they found was in Hawaii is you have all of these like bodies that end up in the water and if they have mineral sunscreen, what happens is some of it comes off into the water and not mineral, I'm sorry, chemical sunscreens, which is your oct octanoxate and oxybenzone, comes off into the water and it was so effective that the sun's rays couldn't penetrate the water. It was actually destroying the coral reefs in Hawaii. Yeah, and that was crazy to think. But as one of the other things is these chemicals are also um, known to cause uh, infertility, reproductive harm. And so it's just been one where it's like, uh, can we move past these chemical sunscreens? The kicker though is, I'll be honest, it was one where, you know, I like to, at least try to keep it real, is that even it's like, let's be honest about, you know, uh, mineral sunscreens. Mineral sunscreens typically use an active ingredient like titanium or zinc, um, which, are, which are very effective. The thing is, is that if you don't go through a purification process, zinc, titanium, also heavy metals. Not that those are bad, but what happens is if they don't go through a purification process, you test for, high, you find high levels of lead, high levels of cadmium. And what happens is it's not as, I'm not as concerned about in terms of, you know, adult exposure, but where I was concerned and we did an investigation on it was when you see these things show up in, you know, kind of sunscreens that are labeled for babies or for kids. I mean, show me a kid, a little baby that doesn't put their hands or feet in their mouth, especially a day at the beach with barbecues and things like that, running around, reapplying it. And then here it is, you have the mineral sunscreen, 
you're only trying to do best by your fan, you know, by your family. And here it is that there's, you know, so it's certain things that, you know, I'm a huge fan of the mineral sunscreen, you know, industry, but it, there's some work to do to make sure that those zinc and titanium sources are in fact clean. And we kind of get rid of all those unnecessary heavy metal contaminants that go along with zinc and titanium. Oh my gosh. A hundred percent. We actually have a question from Rick. Hi, Rick Howard. Um, I, I don't know if he, I think he asked this before we even got to sunscreen, but he was asking, are there any brands specifically to avoid? Um, I feel like there's, there's, from my perspective with me doing research on hair care brands and maybe you could speak more to actual sunscreen brands, but I found there was more to avoid than less. Um, lines that I thought at my salon were really clean that I was carrying because they really market they're sustainable and they're, you know, they're a B corporation and they're, you know, they're um, chemical free. The closer I looked at the ingredients, there was actually a lot of stuff in there that people haven't heard of yet, mm -hmm. you know, like EDTTA and mm -hmm. um, cocamide MEA mm -hmm. and DEA and TEA and all of these things that you're like, well, I don't know what that, maybe most of us read labels and we're like, I don't know what half yeah. of this means. How am I supposed to decipher this? So it's, you know, I had to go and research what does every single thing mean? I mean, even, even some natural stuff, like yeah. we just learned this ingredient that you could barely make out was Brazil yeah. nut oil. And we're yeah. like, oh, this yeah. is not a nut free product. And we try to label everything that's nut free on our, yeah. on our website is nut yeah. free so that with allergies to nuts, um, don't run into it. But side note, but, um, I can't say that there's any specific hair care brands to avoid, um, I know that it's easier to list the ones that you should not avoid, the ones that are good, because that's a much smaller number yeah. than the one to yeah. avoid. So um, from my perspective, anything that is probably under a $15 price point, $10 price point that you're going to find in like a drugstore or grocery store, most likely it's going to have more um, toxic chemicals because they're lower cost. It costs less money to make a beauty product that's full of these really cheap toxic chemicals. I mean, the whole reason these brands are using toxic chemicals is because it has the same results in their eyes as something that's natural and much more expensive to drive, right? So instead of using an essential oil, they're going to go and use this other toxic chemical that's very cheaply made, right? So that's why they're using, they're not using it because they're like, oh, it's going to cost me the same amount to make this all natural product as this fully toxic product, but I'm just going to use these because I just feel like it, right? They're always going to go for, you know, we're, we're a country where everybody's going for the profit margin. So if the profit margin is going to be higher on this guy. This is the one that a lot of companies are going to unfortunately choose. But now as demand is increasing for this guy, people are starting to make changes. So some lines that I can tell you that I've vetted um, at North Authentic, everything we sell at North Authentic has been vetted as far as every ingredient um, has been checked against our board ingredient list. Our brands know that we randomly choose 10 to 15 hair care products every year and just randomly test them with our lab partner to make sure that everything that's in the bottle is also on the label. Um, and then we also test them for, for performance because I think a lot of people want to go clean but they're like, oh, I bought the shampoo at like this health store and it made my hair frizzy and, you know, or I bought, you know, and it's like, I, I get it. The, the move to clean is a tough one. It's not going to be easy for everybody. Not everybody's like ready to start composting, right? So I tell people like, if you want to move to clean, I want to make sure that that transition to clean hair care is easy. I don't want you to buy a clean product and then you're like, I hate this product. So we test it to make sure that it's clean, but it also really works. So that you're like, oh my gosh, I can't move to clean and my life won't change. My life will actually improve. So um, some of the brands on my end for hair would be um, Evolve. Um, it's E-V-O-L-V-H. It's a new, and a lot of these are independent lines. Um, Colton King, um, Reverie, uh, Innersense. Um, we actually are bringing on some new lines, um, 100%. Um, and yeah, and then we also are carrying some lines that we're working actively with them and they're, they should be reformulating, um, so that they're, we have some ingredients we want to add to our barred ingredient list, but because those ingredients are found in so many hair care products, they're actually not in any of the hair care products of the brands I just listed, but those are the few brands I could find that had none of them. But there's, there's things like I had mentioned, acrylates, phenoxthenol, polysorbates. Those 
a, it's really hard to find product lines that don't have those ingredients in them. So because I wanted to be able to offer more than like four or five lines to people, we said, you know, these are the least offenders and hopefully our brands are going to reformulate and we're giving them till 2023. Cause it takes a long time to reformulate these products. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So once those are, are clean enough, hopefully we can keep them after 2023. If they haven't reformulated by then, then we will drop them. Um, but yeah, we have some great brands, um, Olaplex, Away, um, O&M, but um, that's on my end for hair care. Well, what, what yeah, do you think, I would Jackie? Say kind of oh, along those lines is I know that you've been doing a great job of kind of vetting through these brands but especially you know for people that are looking to make the switch or start on a cleaner journey that they're like you know I've been wanting to move away from kind of the drugstore hair care into something a little bit more premium something that's a little bit more aligned with my values you know it's, it's something that I've been literally doing as except on my household cleaning product side is I'm like I'm not going to throw away the you know surface cleaners that I have but what I am going to do is once I finish them one by one, I'm going to slowly start making the, you know, making the change to something else. Cause I want it to be effective. I want it to, you know, I want it to work, you know, cause I, that's, it's got to fulfill its function first. And that same thing with household cleaning is the same thing when it comes to cosmetics and hair care products. Um, so I would say it's, it's little things of so just start somewhere, start with one. You don't have to make that financial commitment. If you're making the change from, you know, drugstore over premium, it's like, Start with, I'm first going to do my shampoo and then I'll do my conditioner and then I'll add on the detangler. And, and the thing is, at least for me, when it comes to hair care, you find out what works for you and then you generally stick to it. And it's one where if I don't, if I don't have it, it's one where it's like, oh my God, if I'm running, I've got to like get by like six of them so that they're in the cupboard. And so that I never, run because it's like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> run out like, no, that's the only thing I have. What I can't function. Um, so yeah, that would be more so my thing is it's like, you know, about about the journey. There's a lot of and it, you know, Natalie's website is such an amazing resource. She's she's done so much heavy lifting for consumers that, you know, want to do right by their health and make those little bit of incremental improvements in the environment as well as in their public health. And I think, you know, just starting one at a time, baby steps, it's a journey and that's okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess if we just step back for a second, I don't want to keep you on, but um, what, why, why is this important? Like, you know, I, you know, I know you mentioned this causes can cause infertility. I also had heard like early menopause, early onset puberty. Like, so a lot of people don't realize that, you know, even the shampoos we're using is affecting their kids. Um, so what, why would somebody make a decision to move to toxin free in their home when it comes to shampoo or cleaning products? Like what's the benefit to them? Yeah. I, I mean, I guess for me, if I was to sum it up, it's always interesting because you know, I boil it down to is everybody has a story. And when I say that, what I mean to it is anytime I do a speaking engagement, it's always one where somebody's like, you know, it's really interesting that you shared that story because my niece has is on the spectrum. My nephew has severe allergies. I had problems, you know, getting pregnant in my, you know, late twenties. Everybody has this story and everybody's trying to find out the origin. And it's always crazy because I'll talk to my friends, you know, about kiddos and things like that. And it's a matter of like, you know, I grew up eating peanut butter and jellies. I mean, hell, I still eat peanut butter and jelly. But for whatever reason, like you cannot consume a PB and J in a public school system or because of chronic peanut allergies. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know, how can it be in the matter of one generation that our digestive systems have been com are now completely inept at handling certain things? Is it literally that we have evolved as humans or is it that food has changed so much? Same thing that comes with these chemical exposures is it's one where it's like, we're not exposing, you know, if we were only exposing ourselves to arsenic, then it's one thing, but it's not arsenic. It's arsenic, it's lead, it's antibiotics, it's phthalates, it's formaldehyde, this. And you know, when they do these studies, they don't look at a single variable of like, well, they do look at single variables. This is the effect of arsenic on the brain, you know, on brain development. This is the effect of residual solvents on autoimmune conditions. But what they don't do is they don't look at the cumulative effect. What happens when you have all of these things in your gut system and you're surrounded by it every day? Not what happens today. What happens 30 years from now, Natalie? And so that's kind of my whole thing is we don't know the answers. This whole thing is almost a really gigantic, very weird science experiment. Um, and so those, it's one where what we can do is we can minimize exposure to it. 
We know that there's no good level of lead that's good for you. We know that nothing is out there saying you need to consume more formaldehyde in your diet and expose your body to more. So let's just voluntarily try to just get less. And I think those are proactive things that we can do as consumers. You know, I always am a big fan of like, you know, one big takeaway point would be that, you know, use your dollars as a vote for the food and consumer product systems that you believe in and choose and make your vote, but use your vote wisely. Yeah. I love it. I love that. Oh my gosh, Jackie. Well, I know we've been going for a while. I have so many more questions I want to ask you, but yes. we're going to have to do another live. Like I want to go into fragrance because that, I feel like that could be alive in and of itself. Um, yeah. I feel like there's so many more things we can get into, but um, I'm going to let you go. And I just want to thank you so much. I hope, I hope you followers have learned so much. I mean, I, like I said, um, I think in even my, my stories leading up to this, I'm like, Jackie is such a wealth of knowledge and she's just also a super cool, easy to talk to person. So she's able to break it down for us to like, okay, yeah, this makes sense. I have to make these changes in my life. No, so, uh, and I appreciate you, Ali, for providing me the platform, as well as for all the work that you're doing to just really try to change kind of hair care and, and personal care as whole, you know, every day on the ground, interacting with consumers and just, you know, making a difference kind of, you know, one day at a time, one shopper at a time. So I appreciate you too. 100%. Oh, have an amazing night. Thank you so much. Thanks. I can't wait to talk to you again. Sounds good. Stay safe. You too. Bye. Bye.